Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm sorry we're having to do this on Zoom. Um, there were quite a number of circumstances which um, led to complete chaos and we decided this was probably the most sensible mm. way to do it. And um, particularly as our speaker happens to be in Portugal at the moment. So this is a very international lecture we're having. Um, Dr. Stephen Brindle has worked for English Heritage since 1989 in a number of roles. He was historian in the London region before becoming an inspector of ancient monuments in the Crown Building team. Uh, he actually worked very closely with our honorary secretary on the Windsor Castle post-fire reconstruction project. Um, he has since 2008 been senior property historian in the cultural division. He has a number of major publications, uh, one on Paddington Station, one on um, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, um, and indeed contributed and edited the volume on Windsor Castle. His next major work to be published will be a new architectural history of Britain and Ireland. And I've been told by our secretary that I have to say the next sentence, which is amongst his many achievements, he was captain of the winning Keeble College team in the last university challenge of the Bamba Gas Gascon era in 1987. But that's not what he's talking to us about tonight. Tonight, he's going to speak to us about the recently completed site presentation project for English Heritage, Reconstructing Bury St Edmunds Abbey. And if you have any questions, if you would like to put it in the chat box, it will be transferred to here and we will pass them on to Stephen for replying. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, very nice to be speaking to you all. I'm going to stop my video. I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to go to... Uh, Stephen, you've disappeared completely. A uh, PowerPoint, um, share. And can you see my screen now? Yes, we can, yes. Okay, so I'm going to stop my video can you still see my presentation yes we can that's lovely Good. there we are thank you very much um i'm giving this lecture but my colleagues carlos and bob uh have um made such an important contribution to this that their names really need to be up there and i'll be referring to them in the course of it Bury St edmunds in suffolk nice old market town with a 15th century parish church, which has become 20th century cathedral. And behind that, uh, there are the slightly depressed looking remains of what was one of the greatest uh, Gothic churches in Britain and indeed in Europe. Uh, we should have one of our greatest medieval cathedrals here. We would have if things had gone differently. But as I say, Bury St Edmunds is a cultural crime scene. Henry VIII and Thomas Cromwell decided that Bury would be one of the places to be made an example of um, to demonstrate that the suppression of the monasteries was for real and the Abbey Church and its principal buildings were systematically and very deliberately demolished uh, and stripped of all usable materials. Um, and the church was probably left looking in this kind of state within 10 or 20 years of the suppression. Um, we lost one of our greatest medieval churches here. And as a result, there is a major interpretive deficit, shall we say, for um, pretty much anyone visiting the site and coming to, to expect to see a medieval monastery. The best preserved elements at Bury, as many of you will know, are the two wonderful gatehouses, uh, the Norman Tower, which led to the Abbey Church itself, and the Great Gate, which led into the Great Court. And they are both masterpieces of respectively uh, English Romanesque and English decorated architecture. Uh, and quite a lot of the precinct wall survives too, but Within that, well, the Abbot's Palace um, stood until the mid-18th century when that was destroyed, uh, and the remains of the site are fairly fragmentary. 
Uh, there is quite a lot there, but the site is a public park. There's a lot of 19th and 20th century landscaping overlying it. It's very difficult to make sense of the site as a great monastic site. Uh, it's been in English Heritage's guardianship. No, it's been in the Crown's guardianship since the 1950s. Um, so we're responsible for the remains, but there are very active local stakeholders, the Berry Heritage Partnership, who um, have been very supportive um, in efforts to try and improve the presentation of the site. Um, and so we have a very active group of local stakeholders, local community in Berry, who are intensely interested in the site and proud of it, uh, and we've long wanted to do better by it. Uh, and so a few years back, we started planning a, a new site presentation project with the basics, a new suite of graphic panels to interpret the site, uh, and we're putting a, a new page on our website. Now, as I say, the Abbey Church and the principal group of monastic buildings were systematically destroyed in the mid-16th century. So you do not have what we might call the classic experience of visiting a monastic site at Berry. Um, 18th century views show the church ruins essentially in their present state. These are some of the earliest views, and they suggest that the major process of demolition did indeed happen in the mid-16th century, um, and leaving the remains pretty much as we see them today. One rather curious point is that the Abbey's west front, the Abbey had, as we'll see, uh, an immensely broad west front, about 240 feet wide, the widest in the British Isles. Uh, the west front remained standing, or rather the lower part of it did, though stripped of all its ashlar masonry, and it got colonised by houses, um, and that still stands with um, six houses built into it, as we'll see. Now, the church here really was um, a giant amongst medieval churches. Um, here it is approximately to scale with some of its peers. Bury was the second longest church in England to Winchester, about the fourth largest and longest in Europe. The only ones that were bigger um, were um, Winchester, Cluny three and Old St. Peter's in Rome was about the same length. That's just about 415 feet long end to end. Um, so it really was uh, an immense building. Now, Berry occupies a very important place in the development uh, of Romanesque architecture in England. Uh, and you see it with some of its comparators here. And we know that it was built with a long absidal east end in order to house the shrine of St Edmund um, and this is one of the reasons why Abbot Baldwin began the construction of a great new abbey church uh, around 1080 and by 1095 the eastern arm was substantially built um, and the shrine of the saint was moved from the circular church that had been built early in the 11th century by King Canute uh, into the new east end and Berry occupied uh, a sort of an architectural family, an identifiable group of Romanesque great, great churches, which, as you see, also include St Augustine's Canterbury um, and Winchester Cathedral and Gloucester, and they, they all had in common, was shrines. Now, when the Abbey Church was demolished, um, a thick layer of demolition rubble was left covering the site. So the entire site was buried uh, about in about two to three metres of rubble and with turf on top of that. Uh, and virtually all of the facing masonry, of the Ashland masonry, had been robbed um, very systematically uh, and sold probably barged down to London, we think. Um, and so the remains that still stand, what you see, is core work and with very little Ashler masonry remaining. And that's one of the problems um, in understanding this as a piece of architecture and, of course, in reconstructing it. Having said that, uh, Berry has been studied by many antiquaries over a long period, all the way back to George Virtue in the early 18th century. And here are two particularly notable 
antiquaries efforts and really given the state of the site they did a pretty good job I think we can say as James Burroughs who published his plan early in the 18th century that's about 1718 um, and on the right uh, the famous Montague wrote James um, who wrote um, a major study of the Abbey's library and he worked out the liturgical plan of the Abbey church from medieval documents um, for although the site of Bury St Edmund's Abbey um, is um, not what it used to be. The Abbey has left behind um, outstanding documentary records, uh, and there are over 200 books which are known to have been in its library, which still exist. Um, and it played an important part in the history of East Anglia and of England, figured in national history at several points. And so the documentary record is very good. Um, and a lot has been published about Berry. But as to its physical remains, well, that is rather a mixed story. As you see, early antiquaries made uh, sustained efforts to uh, get to grips with it. And M.R. James famously excavated the site of the chapter house, and he found the graves of a number of abbots, including the famous Abbot Samson, uh, on the chapter house site. The chapter house walls stand to about um, one to two metres high of, of core work. A major landmark in understanding of the Abbey site um, was the work of a man called Arthur Whittingham. Uh, Whittingham was uh, a conservation architect. He was cathedral architect to Norwich Cathedral, which is probably the building, the single building that is most important as a parallel to Bury, as we'll see. And in 1952, he published a long account uh, of the Abbey in the Archaeological Journal. Um, and his plans were a remarkable achievement given the state of the site and given that at that date there had been very little archaeological intervention uh, and hardly any clearance. Really, only M.R. James's excavation of the chapter house had taken place. And the rest of the Abbey church um, was covered under a thick layer of rubble where only a few teeth of masonry sticking out. Um, and Whittingham's plans, uh, which he put together from what he could see on site and from a variety of historic sources, were really a remarkable achievement. Uh, and generally, his interpretation has held up to scrutiny since. Um, and you might say that everyone looking at the Berry's right since has really been building on, on Arthur Whittingham's work. But all he ever published was this long article, which is written a, a pretty dense kind of way in the AJ. Now, shortly after Whittingham, um, the Ministry of Works, having taken on responsibility of the site, carried out a general clearance of the eastern arm and the transepts in the adjacent areas. And they cleared the rubble um, down to medieval floor level. And that, of course, made the plan of the church comprehensible. Um, it bore out Whittingham and M.R. James's reconstruction of the plan. In large part, it connect, corrected their plans in uh, only quite a, a modest degree. Um, and R. Gilliard Beer published this plan uh, in about 1962. But no other monograph, no other major study ever happened. So what we have is a short account by, by Gilliard Beer. We have this plan and we have an excavation archive, which is mostly of architectural stonework, as we'll see shortly. Now, of course, it was standard practice by the Ministry of Works uh, at monastic sites uh, to do this kind of thing, to clear the enormous quantities of rubble, mostly demolition rubble, um, take uh, things down to medieval ground level in order to recover the plan and make it legible. And of course, at places like Tinton and Rivo, this was carried out pretty much to the entire site. And so the whole monastic layout is legible and um, the plan can be understood and can be understood historically. But at Bury, it's only this area, the transepts and the eastern arm of the church and the immediately adjacent areas, which were subjected to this kind of clearance. So while Bury's wider history has certainly not been neglected, there are very fine historical studies. Uh, there's a volume of BAA transactions uh, devoted to the, to the site. Um, Bury has never had the kind of level of archaeological study and analysis which, say, River Abbey has, because that 
uh, post general process of clearance, which took place at river and fountains and many of other great monasteries, um, didn't happen there. There was the uh, the clearance of the um, the transepts and the eastern arm of the abbey church, and that was all, and it was never properly published. So. Um, the site has, as I've said, a large interpretive deficit. There is a single, uh, really highly imaginative reconstruction drawing, which was made around the time that Arthur Whittingham published his work and partly based on his work, which is, however, um, one has to say is really highly inaccurate and not so fanciful. Uh, but this has had to do duty for about 70 years. Um, and in putting together a new interpretation for the site, really the, the one absolutely indispensable thing it seemed to us was to try and understand the site better as well as we could in the absence of major new archaeological intervention so as to produce new reconstruction drawings because um, this one uh, was never really very good and is certainly not fit for purpose anymore. So where to stop? Well, of course, where we start is with the surviving remains um, and as battered as they are, uh, they're, they're obviously the starting point. And we have the great advantage um, that the Ministry of Works had cleared a good part of the site. Uh, so we had certain knowledge of the plan um, and we do have traces of the architecture low down now, in, in the 16th century, the demolition process involved stripping off pretty well all of the ashlar masonry. Um, and so very little ashlar facing survives. What you see is mostly core work, uh, and that's an issue that will come. There are traces of it. Here is um, one piece of the plinth of a column. Um, so the remains of the crypt, for example, give us accurate data for plan and for the height of the crypt, and they give us little bits of architectural detail. Um, and we have comparative evidence, of course, which is very important in a case like this. We have the contemporary crypt at St. Augustine Canterbury in at Gloucester, for example, uh, where there are marked similarities, and there are marked similarities in both the layout and clearly in the design of the portions in the contemporary crypts at Canterbury and Winchester Cathedral. You compare the surviving uh, traces at Berry, and they compare pretty closely to what they have in these comparative sites. Um, so one major area of doubt here, for example, was the shape of the apse piers, and we op opted for a wedge-shaped form, as it's in Augustine and Canterbury, uh, essentially because um, the the piers in the apse in the apse of the crypt we knew would have to be pretty substantial um, to support three whole stories worth directly above them, and doing the geometry. Uh, and trying various versions out, we didn't think cylindrical piers at crypt level would have been possible to be big enough to have done the job. Um, the gap between them would have been about two feet, which didn't really um, seem like a sensible design. So we opt for a wedge-shaped form there. Um, and here's one of Carlos's early plans reconstructing uh, the dimensions and the portions of the crypt in detail. And from that, uh, Carlos developed a 3D digital model um, which has been uh, the base of our work. So there are the wedge-shaped piers going in and Carlos reconstructing the vaulting pattern. Um, and the way this uh, this proceeded uh, was with Carlos and I surveying the site on a number of occasions uh, and then me making scaled uh, dimension sketches and Carlos working up the 3D, 3D digital model. Carlos is Carlos Lemos, uh, he's our senior graphics manager, formerly of Museum of London Archaeology, um, and this is really uh, as much his project as mine, I should say. Um, now, we did have a couple of valuable things in the plan room. Uh, this plan was made at the time of, um, of the uh, major clearance, uh, and I think you can just see the evidence for internal arcading, which is indicated here. I show you this plan rather than the photograph because actually it's pretty difficult to pick this up uh, on photographs of the evidence. But when you look at, at, the, at the footings um, in detail, the evidence definitely is there. So as battered as the footings are, they give us quite a lot of detail of the plan. We have, for example, the plan and the spacing of the 
wall arcading um, survives in ghost form where the ashlar has been stripped away. You can see the shape of a lot of the piers uh, in, in negative form uh, where the ashlar blocks have been robbed and that kind of thing. And there are also um, the bases of colonnettes surviving because in uh, in a number of areas, the lowest course of ashlar masonry survives. But of course, the key question for a reconstruction is how high was this thing? And here, um, almost providentially, it would seem we have just enough evidence because two of the crossing piers survive. Um, and at an early stage, we commissioned metric survey. We had uh, point cloud data. Um, and metric survey of all the standing remains from Greenhatch Limited, and they here have plotted um, the outlines of the arches onto um, onto the witnesses on the the crossing piers. And as you see, there is just enough evidence there to give us the springing of the aisle arches, to give us um, the level of the triforium, the springing of the triforium arches, and the springing of the crossing arches. And once you push all that together with the plan evidence, which you have, then we can reconstruct the geometry of the internal elevations with some confidence. So here I'm doing it in pencil on the left and Carlos is doing it in the digital model on the right. Uh, and there are some things uh, which are inevitably a little more speculative. For example, we have to work out plausible heights for the outer walls and the triforium, a plausible level for the triforium roof. We know that um, Romanesque builders didn't really like very low roof pitches. Um, and we've based this primarily on the comparative example of Norwich, um, which does seem to work as a comparator for Berry pretty well, as we'll see. So we've got height evidence to give us all the heights really up to the top of the clear story. And there is a certain amount um, of, uh, of guesstimating to do to work out plausible heights for the outer walls. So here is the 3D digital model getting worked up for the east end. There are the, uh, the thickened uh, piers and crit, uh, and there Carlos is working out a geometry for the wall arcading that's on the basis of the witness marks left on part of the site, and also by comparison with Norwich. And next major category of evidence is architectural stonework. And here, imagine the site being demolished by Thomas Cromwell's merry men, and enormous quantities uh, of rubble would be falling on the site. Um, and given that, they have, they robbed the Ashler with incredible efficiency, so that only um, the lowest courses of it survive, one, one imagines where they were completely buried, uh, under piles and piles of, of collapsed rubble core work. But there is just enough um, to give us the plans of the crossing piers, give us the forms of the major compound piers, and to enable us and help us set out the internal lines and surfaces. Um, and between Carlos and Greenhatch, um, we surveyed this uh, with some care. Now, when the site was cleared, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, a great deal of architectural stonework, over a thousand pieces, was salvaged and is now in our archaeological store at Rest Park. And that obviously has been an important source of data because there is a, a lot of architectural detail uh, reposing in this material. Um, so Carlos and I looked at pretty much all of the architecturally significant pieces, um, and we measured and drew a great many of them. Um, so here is an attached shaft, probably from wall arcading, and there is a voussoir from an arch with chevron ornament. Uh, so that clearly is an internal arch, not a window arch. Here are two voussoirs of standard late 11th century forms with big roll moulding uh, and a hollow moulding outside it. Um, and we are uh, we looked at pretty much all of the architecturally significant material and we um, made rather approximate sketches and Carlos made scale sketches uh, of quite a lot of the more important ones. So this is us trying to understand the evidence that we had in the stonework. Um, and we spent quite a long time looking at Norwich Cathedral because as I think you can see, 
um, the architectural detail in Norwich, the form of the arch mouldings, for example, and the column mouldings in Norwich relate very directly to that the evidence that survives in situ on the site of Bury and also to the architectural stonework in the store. Um, and we have enough arch voussoirs left to work out approximately the width of arches, but actually the width of arches is sort of set by the plan in any case. Uh, so here's an example of us thinking about what we've got uh, in, our, in our, our suite of architectural stonework and how we might reconstruct uh, an aisle arcade. Bear in mind that we have the spacings of the aisle arcade uh, from evidence on the site. We have the comparative example of Norwich and we have individual stones which we can relate to blind arcading and to the internal piers and to window linings. And so there's a process of understanding the architectural stonework, relating it to Norwich, and relating it to the portions of the building on site that we're working up in the um, 3D model. Um, there's architectural sculpture, uh, uh, there's a, only a little of it, not that we could do very much with this because of course we don't know exactly where it comes from, but this is just to show you that there is a certain amount of Romanesque sculpture surviving from Berry, some of which, like the uh, sort of Romanesque head on the left, was clearly very fine and gives one some idea of the artistic and architectural quality of the, what the once was. Uh, and here are two pieces of sculpture which probably came from door portals. That's an angel uh, holding a book. So he's probably the uh, evangelistic creature for the, um, the evangelist St. Saint, um, Saint Matthew. Uh, and on the right, um, that is uh, the soul of a covered sinner being thrust by demons into the jaws of hell. The jaws of hell, you should understand to be opening up sort of from below. So think of that as being, being a serpent's mouth opening from below. And, and the, uh, the, the miser, who is probably clutching a money bag, is being thrust into the jaws of hell by two demons on either side. Uh, and this uh, somewhat military scene uh, was probably one of the a jam on the, the main, main West Front portals. Now, Dr. Ron Baxter of the Corpus of Romanesque Sculpture has been of immense help to us in assessing the Berry Stonework. We had a number of site visits with Ron. Uh, he's um, assessed the stonework on the site and at the rest store and in the Moises Hall Museum. And he's already posted descriptions of stones in the Berry assemblages uh, on the Corpus's website, which many of you will be familiar with. So I'd like to record my warm thanks to Ron here uh, for the, the very, very great help he's, he's been uh, in this process. And of course, uh, we, I think, provided some help to him in getting this stuff catalogued and on the Corpus website. Now, um, Berry, as I've said, occupies an important place and quite an early place in the great sequence of major Norman churches in England. This is where it falls, somewhere between uh, Winchester Cathedral, begun just before it, and Ely, begun just after it. Uh, and so we have uh, a, now a fairly well understood architectural context uh, to put this in, and Professor Eric Fernie, uh, of course, our, our leading expert and authority on Norman architecture, has also been um, enormously helpful uh, in guiding us in, um, in developing a reconstruction, um, because the comparative evidence has been very important. Uh, and Eric himself wrote the monograph on Norwich Cathedral, and we were also helped by Dr. Roland Harris there, who, as you may know, is the consultant archaeologist at Norwich. Uh, and so we had a couple of long visits to Norwich to help us understand this, the main comparator to Bury. Um, and so there on the left is what remains of the North Transept Bury. There is a sketch reconstruction, and there is the um, South Transept, actually, at Norwich. We think a flat ceiling, as at Walton Abbey, more likely than a canted one, as at Ely. Um, and contemporary buildings like Norwich and like Dorwich um, give one clues to the likely external treatment. Um, it's easier to reconstruct the internal elevations than the external ones, uh, for the sort of reasons you've been seeing. We have more stonework from inside. Um, and we have the uh, the architectural stonework from low down on the inside of the building, and we which we don't have for the exterior really. Um, so these are stages in the process. Uh, the cylindrical buttresses 
uh, around the East End between the abside chapels. Uh, those are features which we can see evidence of on site. Um, and Norwich had cylindrical buttresses just like those which still exist on the building. Uh, and we've taken, I think, only a small liberty in proposing that they extended upwards as, um, as cylindrical buttresses or cylindrical pinnacles, rather. So these are stages very there. Um, another key question is, how high was the central tower? Well, we know from documentary evidence um, that Berry had bells hanging in its central tower. And there are three surviving Romanesque central towers on great churches in England, which housed and indeed still house belfries, Norwich, Tewkesbury and Albans. And St Albans. in each case, we find the tower is almost exactly twice as high as the nave and transept parapets. Um, and so that gives us a plausible portion uh, and a rough architectural language. And of course, the reason that it has to be twice as high is to allow for a lantern space over the crossing, to allow for the, the rise of the roofs, and then to allow for um, a ringing chamber with natural lighting above that, and to allow for a bell chamber above that and to have a lantern stage and a ringing chamber and a belfry you really need the tower um, to be about that high and so all this roughly seems to tie together and so on that basis we're reconstructing Berry with a big central tower um, we know that this survived until um, a fire which destroyed the roof in 1465 after which the central tower was rebuilt I'll come to that a bit later um, so this is the three digital model getting pretty worked up, um, and here is an external elevation treatment based um, more on Norwich than anywhere else, uh, and with um, with the use of blind arches and blind arcading, uh, which is based on Norwich, and with a, a roughly Norwich inspired central tower. I think I could say, and with a cloister which has these rather low proportions. Uh, in order to come in under the nave window sills. And we know that the cloister would have had to come in under the nave window sills because we have descriptions of stained glass in the windows on the north side of the nave from the later Middle Ages. Um, so we can, the fragments of documentary evidence we have uh, provide clues and pointers in this way. But as you may be thinking, well, there are elements in here which are speculative. Well, yes, there are. But as to the general proportions, remember we have the plan and we can reconstruct the height with sort of pretty much 95% confidence until you get to the tower. And there, I think we have um, a reasonable level of confidence on the base of the comparative evidence. So this is the 3D digital model with those Norwich-style cylindrical buttresses, which we know it to have had uh, between the absidal chapels at the East End. And this brings us to the most enigmatic part of the church, and that is uh, the West Front. Berry had an immensely wide West Front, uh, like a Westwerk in Germany, unlike anything else in England, the, the most comparable structures in England were the, the West Fronts at Lincoln and Ely, which are some help in understanding it, but not all that much. Uh, the one at Berry was um, wider. Uh, but we do have um, a proper survey for the first time, which gives us uh, exact height evidence uh, for everything. But the complicating factor here is that the building has really suffered enormously um, the Western Tower, which we know to have risen above the, the west end of the nave, collapsed in 1430. Or rather, it partly collapsed and it was taken down and it was rebuilt. And it is apparent when you look at the West Front building that there is an enormous amount of late medieval intervention in it. Um, a great deal of work was done after the 1431 collapse and dismantling to strengthen the structure. Um, by um, a succession of masons, but notably Thomas Mapledon and Simon Clarke, before the, the Western Tower could be reconstructed. Uh, and so disentangling the Romanesque fabric from the later medieval alterations, given that subsequently all of the ashlar was stripped off, is, um, well, challenging. 
Now, here's some complicated evidence. Frankly, the West Front building could be a whole lecture in itself. Uh, what you're looking at here uh, in brief on the left, you are looking at the negative impression of a 12th century arch, which has been blocked in the mid 15th century with, um, with, with plaster and with rubble masonry. And then in the 16th century, the demolition men have come along and they have scraped back the masonry from the outer side. And remember, they're hunting for ashlar. And so they have robbed some of the ashlar blocks from that arch. So where you see what looks like the shape of an arch, that is the negative impression um, of a 12th century arch made by the removal of the ashlar blocks by demolition men who were clawing their way through the wall from behind. And as you can see, some of the, um, the ashlar blocks of the arch remain in situ, some have been robbed. That's why you have that rather complicated effect. And the cylindrical looking thing on the right, that is a 12th century spiral stair which would have led up to the higher reaches of the West Front building, which was filled in in the 15th century as part of the Masons' great attempt to thicken up the structure because they were going to rebuild a great big West Tower. And then in the 16th century, the demolition men have scraped away part of the, um, the outer part of the spiral stair and they have revealed part of the cylindrical shaped blocking. And that appears on the right hand side of the right hand image. So there you're looking at the same thing, but this is part of the green hatch survey. So you're looking at the arches, which were at the south end of the west transept, which were blocked in the 15th century. And on the right, you are looking at groined vaulting from one of the lateral chapels in the West Front building. So as I say, the archaeological evidence, uh, there's evidence here all right, but it's pretty challenging and complicated because there are layers of late medieval intervention and then there is the havoc wrought by the demolition men in the 16th century and then there's the, the fact that houses have been built into it. Um, we've been much helped by the friendly and helpful occupants of the said houses who welcomed us in. Um, so we could see strange and mysterious things like this. What you're looking at on the left is the back of a cushion capital, which is now um, in midair, so to speak, and seen from behind. That is as if you were in the middle of a wall. And what you're looking at on the right, of course, is, is an engaged nookshaft that was part of uh, an arch, probably a blind arch, actually. And this is my attempt to um, plot those things uh, in space because they're at funny levels and to understand how they may have formed part of a piece of medieval architecture. Now, we haven't yet surveyed all these features in the West Front building properly, which is why you're looking at my nasty sketches uh, and not at a proper drawing. Uh, so in some respects, this is still a work in progress, and this ought to be verified by more accurate surveying. But uh, in the, the process, uh, there are a lot of things we haven't been able to do yet, because um, we had on the one hand to deliver a new interpretation program to uh, to a program and a budget, and we also have a, a highly challenging archaeological site to look at. The West Front uh, started off uh, as a West transept um, with absidal chapels to either side of it, and then in the late 12th century, Abbot Samson added octagonal towers at either end of the West Front. We don't know exactly how high they were, and only one of them survived in any case. Here it is, and now it forms another house. But what you're looking at is the evidence of, um, of one original window, uh, which has its original window linings. As you see, the other windows uh, were restored in about 1830 to make them look more Norman uh, in, um, in Roman cement uh, and to the wrong size and shape, uh, which wasn't really very helpful um, to, to we antiquaries. Uh, but we do have um, the 
the dimensions of low, lowest stage of windows preserved in that blocked opening. As you see, we've only got the inner opening because all of the ashlar masonry and has been robbed, and with it the um, the outer orders of that of that window. So here's um, this is me again. I'm. Uh, sorry to say, trying to understand the plan and put all this together. So what you have here is a short west transept with a tower rising above the west end of the nave, uh, as at Ely, and abcidal chapels to either side of that, and then Abbot Sampson's octagonal towers to either side of those. Um, this plan embodies a socking great mistake um, which was um, my misreading of the evidence for groin vaulting. I thought that the chapels um, had four bays of a groin vault with a central pier, and then Carlos remeasured, um, and uh, and it seemed um, clear that they didn't. Um, that they had were groin vaulted in a single span, which actually makes more sense when you come to look at the West Front, as we'll see, because there is evidence of them having had openings on the West Front. Um, the chapels were single vessels, they had Western arches of windows, and indeed, if you look at the, um, the left hand, uh, look at, you're looking at the survey, you're looking at the, um, the opening on the left hand side of it, that um, 19th century window above the gateway, that is essentially um, in a medieval window position. Um, and that is the inner order of a 12th century window partly surviving. No, I think I mean the outer order there. Um, so um, we um, made mistakes in early stage. Uh, I think we've uh, corrected most of them. Um, and on this basis, um, we produced uh, a reconstruction of the West Front. The best stylistic evidence of it comes from the contemporary Norman Gate, which of course still exists and shows us just how beautifully finished um, Abbot Baldwin and Abbot Anselm and Abbot Sanson's church was with its superb Barnack stone ashlar facing. Um, so here is um, our reconstruction of the West Front in 3D digital model. Um, with the great um, arcaded uh, openings, uh, similar to those at Lincoln Cathedral, for which we have our archaeological evidence in the standing buildings, uh, with the single openings to the abcidal chapels, uh, and the the towers to either side reconstructed. Their their height has to be has to be uh, had to be estimated pretty speculatively, and I would have to admit that is probably the most speculative element in this whole thing. Now, as to the internal layout, this seemed very important if we were going to explain the Abbey Church um, in any coherent way to our visitors. Now, fortunately for us, M.R. James and Arthur Whittingham had both done a lot to, um, to, re to understand the layout of the medieval church from documentary sources. Um, and... Uh, that's M.R. James's plan on the left, and he'd worked out where all the altars were, um, and um, and where the and the layout of the shrine area from a number of medieval documents. There's a couple of uh, liturgical descriptions uh, of liturgy, in particular the order in which um, the altars and things had to be sent from the late Middle Ages which helped one to reconstruct the late medieval uh, arrangement. And so uh, this is my um, detailed reconstruction of the layout, to try and understand how it worked, um, with a, a quite a large shrine area um, uh, encompassing the apse and a full bay behind the high altar with the Shrine of St Edmund and three subsidiary shrines around it um, and a big choir. The point about the choir was it had to be big enough to accommodate up to 80 monks uh, and so that would really have to be the crossing and two full bays of the nave. Um, and we know that there was um, a nave altar dedicated to the Holy Cross um, so there couldn't have been a central entrance to the choir, and we later realised that there must have been a full bay between the choir and the pulpit, and I'll come to that in a bit. So this is me trying to work out um, plausible proportions for the choir stalls, 
and a plausible height for the altar and altar screen, given that the monks would surely have wanted the shrine of St Edmund behind the high altar to be visible from the choir. Uh, and this indeed is hinted at um, in several late medieval representations of the shrine. Uh, the representations are all in uh, an MS History of England by the Berry historian John Lydgate. Um, there are several um, miniature views of the shrine from which we know its form. So what you're looking at there is Lydgate praying at the shrine um, and with the um, and with the, the metal screens and the ferriture around it. And what it suggests is that the shrine was indeed visible from the choir, which is what one might suppose from practice in other great churches. Um, so this is Carlos, this uh, 3D digital model, um, and with uh, a reconstruction of the internal layout of liturgical arrangement, with reading from the left the altar of the Holy Cross, a pulpitum, um, a full bay behind that, uh, what was called the Great Step with the entrance to the choir. The Great Step was, in effect, the monastic naughty step where monks who were being disciplined had to stand during um, during the Opus Dei. Uh, and then the, the choir itself with enough space for, um, for 80 full choir stalls on either side, um, separate stalls for the abbot and the prior on either side, uh, sedalia for the choir altar, more sedalia in the sanctuary for the high altar, of course, um, and um, the shrine of St. Edmund rising above um, the high altar screen. Uh, there is a lot more that we could do, and there's a lot more we need to know um, about the Abbey. For example, um, there were major changes to it in the 15th century, which we haven't fully understood yet. We know that major works were undertaken to the West Front building after the collapse of 1430 to 31, and we know there's a lot of the fabric of the building, the blocked arches you see on the left, um, and these what look like blind arches on the right, and that's actually, those are actually two, uh, the base of two windows above them, which would have been at clear story level. We know that a lot of the windows in the West Transept were blocked in the 15th century in an attempt to make the structure more solid. Some elements of the 15th century work, like the nave vaulting, uh, can only be re re reconstructed speculatively. We never will have more evidence than we do now, and we had to reconstruct them for reconstruction drawings to be possible. So I drew um, the simplest kind of 15th century Leon vault uh, for Carlos and Bob to follow, this is what you're looking at here. This is a first crack at the West Front in 1500, but I don't think um, the West Front, uh, the West End of the, of the lateral chapel precinct to, it is best described as a work in progress. Arthur Whittingham provided uh, a first, a magnificent benchmark for understanding with his plan published in 1952. Um, but the reconstruction drawing we had to work with is very much less impressive, shall we say. Now, we couldn't just leave it, uh, leave things like this. We couldn't go on reproducing this. So what does one do? Well, we did at least have the Green Hatch survey. Uh, we had accurate survey evidence for, um, for, for the ground, for the whole plan of the site, and we had height evidence for all of the standing remains for the first time. So um, the answer on this occasion was another extended desktop survey using the Green Hat survey, historic views, and such height data as could be extrapolated from the surviving structures, really, and from a few documents like the one you see on the left. So on the left, there is uh, an 18th century view of the abbot's house made shortly before it was destroyed. And on the right, there's one of my scale sketches. And I made about 35 of these in this process. Um, and they form a rather crude desktop survey together with quite a lot of documentary work. Uh, and here, for example, is a sketch, is my sketch reconstruction, trying to work out plausible proportions 
uh, of the freighter. There was enough evidence on site to work out a plausible bay rhythm for it, um, with bays just a little over three metres wide. Um, and on this basis, uh, my wonderful colleague Bob constructed um, a 3D digital model um, of the entire precinct. So this is at a rather this is rather more speculative than our reconstruction of the Abbey Church. Remember the preservation here is um, pretty ropey. There are places where we have whole structures still standing like precinct walls and the two gatehouses um, and there are fragments of other structures um, but there is a lot has to be reconstructed speculatively here but really what is needed here I think um, is uh, a fuller archaeological survey of the site as a whole to understand its development better um, with, uh, I think one might hope, some limited and targeted archaeological um, investigation in the future. But for the time being, well, we had to do something, uh, and so this is what we've done. And so in conclusion, where we've got to um, is here, because um, just to bring you back to where we started, uh, we started with our huge interpretive deficit on the site. There were uh, some really um, some pretty time expired panels uh, with some uh, reconstructions which really weren't very good um, and we badly needed new interpretation for the site and we have installed a suite of 12 new panels which incorporate six reconstructions uh, and which have been uh, really very well received. So here's one of our new panels, this is what they look like, and this is our reconstruction of the Abbey Church interior. And just take you through um, the output uh, of the project so far. This is um, my wonderful colleague Bob Marshall's reconstruction of the West Front, which I know looks disconcertingly real. Uh, so this is uh, Carlos and my work, uh, Carlos's 3D digital model uh, made into a real 12th century building by Bob. Um, here is um, the 3D digital model again, which uh, we think will be a valuable tool and resource for the future. Uh, and we're very much hoping that we'll be able to extend it, roll it out to other parts of the Abbey site uh, in the future. There is, of course, as many of you will know, an enormous amount of work in such things. Um, and Carlos and I have, uh, we've all had to move on to other projects since then, but we hope this will be a a valuable resource for the future. This is another of the finished reconstructions. This is the one we wanted one to show Canute's Rotunda in the period when it was still there before it was demolished uh, around um, 1270 to make way for a new lady chapel. Um, so I we did an estimated, we estimated its height and its appearance uh, really based on, um, well, not very much, to be honest, on the plan of St. Augustine's Rotunda, and we guesstimated heights for it. And it really comes out looking pretty small compared to Abbot Baldwin's giant new church. Um, we reconstructed the nave with uh, a late medieval pulpitum because we believe the uh, we have documentary evidence that the choir and the choir stalls were rebuilt in the 1460s and 70s. Um, so uh, we've designed a 15th century pulpitum and nave altar dedicated to the Holy Cross for the nave, and we've given it a Leon vault. We know it to have been vaulted in the late Middle Ages, and so we've given it a, a Leon vault rather than a fan vault. Uh, by the Mason Simon Clark, uh, roughly on the model of the one at Norwich Cathedral, which of course dates from the 1470s and 80s. Uh, and there is, uh, this um, appears on none of the panels, to interpret the church interior and the liturgical arrangement and to give uh, our visitors a sense of um, how the church functioned. And here is a reconstruction of the cloister. And in this reconstruction, we've imagined that the chapter house has just been rebuilt, uh, which we, as we know it was, in 1220, uh, in the style of the Chapel of Lambeth Palace or the Temple Church, when English Gothic architecture um, was at that critical stage. Uh, is Bob's rather wonderful evocation of the, of the chapter house uh, nearing completion as a building site. And this is what we're our visitors for the time being, a reconstruction of the precinct 
that's the Great Court on the left, um, the Abbot's Hall, the Abbot's Lodgings, or the great uh, late 13th century Great Chamber, and the main group of monastic wings to the right, uh, and the church itself. Um, so, I would not pretend that this is the last word on Bury St Edmund's Abbey um, by any means. It's uh, a fascinating site um, and uh, in many ways a rather enigmatic one. Um, but we, we've we done our best to provide um, new site interpretation, which we hope will give visitors to the site uh, a much more vivid and compelling idea of the great lost building which there once was here. Um, we are planning to publish our work on the reconstruction of the Abbey Church, uh, possibly in the Suffolk proceedings, I'm not quite sure. Um, but we, um, and we are hoping that in partnership with the Berry Heritage Partnership, we'll be able to move on to a further more Well, I hope Stephen is still there. Um, he seems to have disappeared. Um, I think we have a few questions. So, um, Stephen, if you are there, are you happy to answer some questions? More detail, Faith. Lindsay, can you hear me? I can now, yes, yes. Are you happy to answer some questions now? I'm very happy to answer some questions. Um, well, the first question, I think in some ways, has slightly been answered, but I'd like to sort of slightly mm -hmm. um, redraft it. Um, you showed us where the shrine of St Edmund's was. Mm. Um, did that hold the whole body of St Edmund's or was it just relic bits of him? And is he still there or was he chucked out during the Reformation? <laughs> <laughs> now that, Lindsay, is a very good question indeed. The shrine certainly housed St Edmund's whole body. Right. Uh, we know that um, St Edmund was uh, decapitated well, uh, legend says that he was decapitated, uh, but the shrine, the one that was rehoused under Knut, um, certainly housed his whole body uh, and with his head. Uh, and occasionally the coffin was opened and people had a look. Oh, yeah. uh, now, at the suppression, um, the shrine was despoiled by, um, they found a very large shrine, very cumbrous to despoil, uh, and they carted off about a £1,000 worth of gold and jewels from it, curse them, uh, did, did Cromwell's commissioners, and the remains just disappeared. The monks hid them. And so there have been persistent rumours in Bury um, that, um, that St Edmund, King Edmund, was reinterred somewhere nearby. And we know that the monk's cemetery was just east of the church. And there were, until quite recently, um, tennis courts on the mm -hmm. possible site. And so the, um, the, the, the Bury um, urban myth was that if Leicester had a king under the car park, that they had a king under the tennis courts. Um, I, um, uh, how would one possibly know? Uh, the, the, the traditional saying about needles and haystacks brings to mind. Um, the people of Bury would, would, would love to find him, um, but, I, um, but I think I would shake my head rather sadly. Uh, I think the monks probably did hide the remains somewhere. Yes. Yes. It is going to be difficult, though, if you find them, to be convinced that that's who it is, so isn't it? Unless it, well, um, unless it was labelled. <laughs> how would you manage for DNA evidence this yeah. time? <laughs> Very tricky on that. Yeah. Yeah. Now we have another question from Brian. Is there much scope for geophysical survey, in particular ground penetrating radar survey, to achieve a better understanding of the precinct? Ooh, uh, yes, very probably. There have been bouts of rather inconclusive, I think, radar survey and mag survey in the past, uh, which just sort of show, um, which have shown us not very much. Uh, almost certainly there is, um, there is scope for more remote survey, yes. Now, I'm not sure how the um i'm not sure how the technologies cope with enormous quantities of rubble there's a lot of the site in particular the central group of monastic buildings is still has a lot of demolition rubble over it right. um and the the nave of the church has two meters plus uh, of rebel right. rubble over it so i'm not sure how the technology would cope with that yet 
a lot of it were talking about demolition rubble above medieval ground level. Right, well, it sounds like a bit of a challenge there. So it's, yes. I think so. Um, now, does anybody else have any other questions at this stage? Mm. There's a lot, a lot to take in there, and probably people will think of questions as soon as we mm. stop the meeting. But uh, no, I think we seem to be um, questionless at this stage. So could I um, say that Stephen, at the beginning of this talk, called the destruction of the Abbey a cultural crime? And I think tonight what we've seen is a detective story reconstructing the scene of the crime. Mm. Um, it's been a meticulous assessment of the evidence using a wide variety of sources um, leading to wonderful reconstructions. I know you want to tweak them, but I think they're looking very convincing to me at the moment. Um, thank you very much. We, we, thank mm. you, we thank you very much for revealing this story to us tonight, but also we very much thank you for all the work that went into producing that reconstruction. This has been a most extraordinary piece of assessment, and we thank you very much for it. Unfortunately, you'll have to just mm. imagine a great rousing round of applause at this stage, which is very frustrating. <laughs> But, uh, we thank do you thank very you. much, Lindsay. And uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for watching. Um, yes, I've, uh, I've always hated Thomas Cromwell. <laughs> oh, dear, yes. So um, all I can do now is to say that our next meeting is on the 14th of December, and it's entitled Return to the Neanderthal Site at La Cote de saint Bernard. Um, by Dr. Matthew Pope, and we look forward to seeing you all then. Um, good night, uh, everybody. Good night, Stephen. Good night. Thank you.